Ever since I saw this photo as a kid, I've been obsessed with the idea of isolated houses. I drew pictures of them in my school books, I subscribed to cabin porn, and lately, for some reason, working from home, I felt the strong urge to escape to one. Virtually, of course, because the chances of getting to see one during this pandemic probably pretty slim. And while most of the videos on my channel show you a step-by-step -step process on how to do something, this video is gonna be a little bit different because I recently started a podcast and let people send in questions. And I realized that a lot of artists have a lot of self-doubt when they're going about creating something. And I can't help but feel like tutorials like mine are partly to blame because the tutorials that you watch are like a perfect speed run of how to do something. But when you watch it, you don't realize the hours of experimentation, building, rebuilding, and then rehearsing it multiple times that led to that perfect short format that you watched. So in this video, I wanna show you the truth. Every mistake, every slip up, every dead end, every waste of time that artists usually spend creating scenes like this. You will learn the overall workflow for creating a complex environment and animation like this. But more than that, I hope you'll see just how little I know about what I'm doing and why that's very common when you're making something for the first time. So with that out of the way, let's get started. Every new project begins with an inspiration search. And I personally like Pinterest because you can keep clicking on the related results until you find exactly what you need. I then paste the images into PureRef, which is free software designed just for this purpose. And then I generally move that to a separate monitor while I work. It makes things easier when you work in real world measurements from the start. So I made the ground 100 by 100 meters and then a two story A-frame cabin, I guessed at around six meters high. And I also like to add a human to give me some reference scale. At this stage, I'm restricting myself to only the big shapes. The medium to small details will come later once I know that the scene is headed in the right direction. I do need a ground material though, so I browsed a bunch of the new scans from Polygon. I like the look of this one. And then I used the Beta Toolbox add-on to automatically create the material for me along with adaptive displacement. And speaking of keeping things to a real world scale, the texture scale is just as important as the scale of the objects. A polygon, most of ours are labeled, so you just take the size of the object, in this case 100 meters, and then divide it by the size of the texture, which in this case is three meters. You'll then have the correct texture scale for that object. And yes, in case you didn't know, you can do any calculation in any field of Blender. And as I mentioned in my tiling tutorial, even seamless textures like this will look repeated when it's tiled 33 times. So using the Uber mapping node that the add-on gives you, I randomized the placement and effectively erased any noticeable tiling. Now, normally I would light a scene like this with an HDR, but I wanted to try the new sky texturing node that Blender comes built with. And having now tried it, I can say it's awesome. You can set the time of day, the direction, the size of the sun, the air quality, even the altitude of the scene. It's basically like an HDR that you can control without needing to download anything. For the trees, I estimated it being far too time consuming to create any myself, so I just bought a collection that I found on Max Tree. I then used it as a particle system across the ground. I also like the idea of having God rays coming through the trees, so I created a big box to cover the whole scene and assigned a tiny amount of volumetric density to it. And this is what I got, which as a proof of concept showed me that the scene might actually work. I experimented with a different aspect ratio, increasing the number of trees. I made one lie down, which didn't look good, so I removed it. Then I added in some lumpy hills, as well as overlaying a roots material over the ground. But the big missing ingredient was plants, so that's what I added next. I started grabbing random plants and logs from Megascans, along with a few free items like sticks from the Sketchfab add-on, which downloads Creative Commons assets and imports them with one click. It's actually a really impressive resource that you'd already know about if you were on my This Week in 3D mailing list. You'd also know about the D-Lit photo scan rocks from Polygon, which I also used for the scene. At this point, I realized I was gonna need a lot of particle systems, and all this clicking was set to give me carpal tunnel syndrome. I'd heard good things about the scatter add-on, so I decided to give it a shot. It basically automates a lot of the steps required to set up particle systems. You set the ground, select the objects you wanna scatter, choose the scatter preset and hit scatter. You can also do batch operations like mask out a footpath and then apply it to multiple particle systems. And honestly, it saved me hours of work. It's great, really. 
But I'm very excited about the next version of Blender because it's supposed to have geometry nodes, which brings proper scattering through the use of nodes instead of particles. So I'm hoping that the next forest I make won't need any add-on at all, but for the time being, the scatter add-on is a godsend. So I played with the lighting, the plants, just trying to improve upon it each time. And then I did something that a lot of you might find odd, and that's to start the scene over from scratch. Now, the reason I do this is that when you're in the discovery stage, you end up making lots of little mistakes that compound on top of each other. But by literally starting a brand new blend file and redoing everything, you're forced to revisit the decisions you made and almost always improve upon each one, resulting in a scene that is significantly better. For a while, I thought I was the only one doing this, but turns out it's a very common technique used in production. So with a fresh scene, I started switching up the foliage. I tried out the grass, realized that didn't work for a forest, then played with the lighting, more foliage changes, less trees and a square aspect ratio, just trying ideas. But the biggest unknown variable I needed to experiment with was the position of the camera and the lighting. And even if I spent all day moving the camera and lights, then waiting for a render, then doing it again, I probably still wouldn't find the perfect shot because the perfect shot might not be somewhere I'd choose. Then I hatched an idea for how to speed this up. So what I did was I created a keyframe for the camera. Then I went to the graph editor and selected the X channel and added a noise modifier. So now every frame in that will move to a random place on the X axis. Now, if you repeat that for the Y channel, then it'll move to a random place within that area. Then if you track the camera to the cabin, the camera will move, but it will always be locked onto the cabin. But why stop there? I wasn't sure what focal length I wanted either, so I randomized that. And since we're using the wonderful new sky texture node, I also randomized the sun placement and the sun size. So what this meant was, all I had to do was hit render animation overnight. And then when I woke up, I had 250 unique renders with different camera positions, focal lengths, and lighting ideas to choose from. The point wasn't for this to be a final render, just to present possibilities. And yes, while most of them are duds with like a tree blocking the camera or the camera in a tree, a surprising number were a combination of factors that I wouldn't have picked myself, but look good for reasons that are hard to pinpoint. Like shrouding the cabin in shadow, but everything else in light, or the opposite of that, or a really wide shot with dappled light stretching across the ground, or almost no lighting with stark silhouettes against the horizon, or the cabin being barely visible behind rows of trees. I was happy the idea worked, but what excited me most was how much time this saved. Because moving the camera, changing the light, then waiting five minutes to see the results was a process I've always despised. But with this method, not only does it happen while I sleep, but it often shows more interesting ideas than I would have found myself. So I used this scatter gun technique multiple times while creating the forest. The one downside to the sky texture is that unlike an HDR, you get an empty horizon, which looks pretty fake. Now the masochists out there might stretch their scene kilometers in all directions, but I opted for a cheaper substitute. Just make an angled plane, then assign the same tree particle system to that, and then the tops of the trees block the horizon in much the same way it would if you were on a mountain. I also increased the number of trees and rendered another set. And it was finally starting to look interesting, like a kind of mysterious forest. The Nightwalker was scaring me though, so I swapped it for this sitting dude from Render People, which actually made it into the final render. And I gradually started adding detail to the cabin, improving the ground cover with larger ferns and more dead stuff like logs. The biggest issue I noticed though was the trees. As nice as the tops looked, the base looked comically bad, which is a problem that almost all bought tree models have. Don't know why, but the tree trunks always look terrible. And while you can find photo scan tree trunk bases, they are extremely difficult to blend with the model. And I would know because I wasted the best part of two days trying every method for blending them you could think of. And eventually I just slapped it over the top and it looked as bad as you'd expect. Then by chance, someone on Twitter mentioned a Blender add-on I hadn't heard of before called mTree, which generates, as you'd expect, trees. Now, as I said earlier, I know from experience how difficult trees are to create, so I was very reluctant to pick up a new tool. But given how important trees were to the scene, I gave it one last Hail Mary and loved it. <laughs> Unlike the sapling add-on, which is menu bound, mTree is node-based, so you can create as many levels of branches as you want. 
It's also super responsive in preview mode, which is great. And then in final mode, it properly blends the branches together with proper UVs and everything. It's great. The only missing feature was the ability to create a proper lower trunk, but I modeled it easy enough with proportional editing. And I also remembered from that Far Cry 5 Houdini video that trees tend to raise the ground around them, which is hopefully something that might be possible with geometry nodes one day. But for now, I imitated that with a little dirt mound attached to the base and that worked surprisingly well. At this point, I've been working on the scene for so long that I honestly couldn't tell what it needed next. So I knew it was time to get some feedback. So I posted a few frames to Twitter and just let it come in. Now, every artist has different opinions on receiving feedback. Mine is this. The general public's gut reaction about what looks odd is usually right, but they're often wrong about what they think will solve it. So what I mean is if someone says, the lighting looks weird, maybe add some clouds. The first part has merit because it's their gut reaction, especially if it's said by multiple people. But the second part may or may not be the solution to the problem. If they're an artist themselves, there's a higher chance than it is, but I generally just listen to the gut reaction from non-artists. Now, in this case, two comments stood out to me. The first said that the ferns look weak, which was a fair call. They were low res models for gaming. So I instead replaced them with these ones from Polygon and they came out much nicer. And the second comment was that it was lacking the chaos of normal forests, which was also a fair call. So I duplicated the trees, deleted the leaves, laid it down on its side and then scattered it in a few places. And as well as that, I multiplied the amount of logs, rocks, etc. I kept experimenting with the amount of trees and lighting as that seemed to have the biggest impact on the scene. I also added a pathway to see if that helped with the composition and not surprisingly it did. So I locked in this angle to shoot the cabin with because I felt it was the strongest. Feedback is free, so each time I posted the results to Twitter to gauge reactions, and more than one person didn't like the trees, which was a shame since I went to all the trouble of making them myself. So I was going for those large redwood trees, but I didn't really have the right texture for it, so the trees looked like large, boring blobs. And that was a fair call. So I remade the tree with a much smaller radius, and while I was at it, I also redid the entire scene for the third and final time. And straight away, it was looking better. I also went for a bushwalk that day and noticed that ivies were pretty much everywhere in nature. So I added some to the trees using the Ivy Gen add-on that Blender comes with. The annoying thing is you can't like change the angle of the leaves. So that's annoying, but whatever, it came out okay. Posted those online and many people called out the path for looking fake, which was a fair call. So I completely swapped out the texture for this forest debris looking one and also hand painted a mask, which I used to blend in this separate rocky ground texture. I also noticed in a lot of photo references, there were always these like smaller bushes scattered throughout the floor that could survive with less light on the ground. Uh, so I generated some with M-Tree. And my dad dropped by one day and said that the cabin looked like some sort of alien artifact because it was perfectly triangular. And I took that to mean that it should be rotated so that you could see the roof and identify it's an A-frame cabin. And I knew the cabin should be the focal element. So I played with the lighting until it shone directly across the front. And that was my lighting. And as much as I really loved God Rays, Cycles really struggles with volumetrics right now. So I removed it and instead enabled a mist pass, which I comped in. So that way you get the atmospheric fall off, but unfortunately no God Rays. While I was there, I also added the tried and true lens distortion, chromatic aberration, glare and sharpening. Now at this point, I was feeling pretty good. I felt like the scene was coming towards a logical conclusion. And then I asked my wife for her feedback and she said the floor looked too green. And that bugged me because the forest floor is very integral to the believability of a forest. And that comment told me that maybe the foliage wasn't suitable. So I stripped the floor back to nothing and then slowly started adding elements one by one. And it turned out that the missing ingredient was sticks, pine debris, and leaves. When I added those, it improved immediately. And I probably would have learned this a lot sooner had I been working more closely from reference photos. Anyway, I posted it online for one last round of feedback, hoping there was nothing, but of course there was. Apparently the pathway that I created now looked big enough to be a road, but it didn't have any tire marks. I wasn't planning for it to be a road, but eh, what the heck? You gotta get there somehow, might as well be by car. So I sculpted in some tire ruts and added in this $10 SUV I found on Blender Market. Then for the final camera motion, I happened to spot this animation by my friend Colin Levy. And I liked how the camera started looking down and then panned up, so I shamelessly copied it. 
I then rendered my first ever animation in 4K, which at 300 samples plus the optics denoiser came out to 15 minutes per frame, or about 62 hours of continuous rendering on dual Titan RTXs. Now you could absolutely render this sort of animation on a cheap laptop, but it would probably take weeks or months rather than days. And when you factor in all the creative decisions made after rendering, you can see why serious artists invest in beefy machines. And really serious artists like Jama Jurabave buy four 3090s because they can. So with the massive lead up, here's the moment you've been waiting for, the final animation. And yeah, that's it. Was it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> Took two to three weeks of full-time work, which is pretty lengthy, but I did overcome a lot of challenges and I learned a new workflow so I could create another forest now in maybe two to three days instead of weeks now that I know the process, which is really what the career of an artist is all about. You try something, you hopefully achieve it, and then you grow and then you make your next work even better. At this moment right here, right when you've finished a project, most people's instinct is to drop it and start something else. But if you really want to improve, you can multiply your learnings by spending a few minutes doing a post-mortem while the information is fresh. This is where you write down what you would improve if you had to do the scene again. So in my case, I probably should have started with some thumbnail sketches because I don't think the layout that the scene had was that exciting in the end. And I also would gather more reference of forest floors before starting so that I would have learned, you know, that I needed sticks and leaves in order to make a good forest floor. So those two things probably would have resulted in a better image faster. So if I save this post-mortem somewhere that I can find it later, then the next time I start an environment, I'll have my past self talking to my future self with some sage advice. Scratching my itch with this cabin scene is exactly what I love about being a 3D artist. When you have an idea about something you want to create, you can do it. And with Blender, the free open source 3D software, you can do it for free. And using YouTube tutorials, you can learn it for free. So if you're curious, I have a beginner YouTube playlist for complete beginners, where you'll learn the essential functions of Blender while making your very own donut. It is the number one beginner's course, which millions of people have completed. It is 100% free. If you want to get started, click that little I button up there to start watching. And if you're already a 3D user and you want to create better environments, download some of the new 8K photo scan assets from Polygon. We've got new grounds, rocks, and plants that are optimized and ready to use in all major software and renderers. We spend thousands of dollars per asset so that you can have peace of mind that they'll work in any scene. So go to polygon.com to get started. And if you enjoyed this breakdown, hit a like and then check out some of these other breakdown videos on the screen right now. Thanks for watching. See you in a future video.